Hey guys, look who's back! Yes, it's me, Four Clicks Philip! Did you miss me? Haha! <laughs> look at me! Wee! Wee! Hi! I wasn't in part four of the making of because it was all pretty much commentary about the video, but due to popular demand, I'm back! I, the icon for Two Clicks Philip, will show up when I'm talking about the video and I'll disappear when it's narration from the original video! As an example, here's something I forgot to point out in the previous making of. Right now he is on his way to Winterhold to speak with Ulfric Stormcloak. Uh oh, I did a whoopsie! I accidentally called Windhelm Winterhold because all of the names in Skyrim are super similar and generic sounding. So while the YouTube version will forever be wrong because YouTube won't let you change videos once it's released, I fixed the archive version. Just listen. Right now he is on his way to Windhelm to speak with Ulfric Uh oh, moustache, bye. <laughs> Hi, Two Clicks Philip here, and welcome to the final chapter of the making of Ogrub 3, part 5. Ogrub has just killed everybody in heaven, thus getting kicked out and returned to Skyrim until his task is done. But I'm going to stop you here. I didn't know how to have Ogrub waking up without there being a bed somewhere. So I proudly present the world's smallest bed. You see it? Enhance! Enhance! Now you've seen it. And here's something that I didn't have time to add for the YouTube version, but have added to the archived version of the video on my hard drives. Where he'll go after he dies now is anyone's guess. It makes sense, doesn't it? After his death, Ogrub becomes the Doom Guy, going to hell and terrorising the demons there. How had I not seen it previously? I seriously considered delaying the video's premiere for a day to add this in, among other small changes with this final part of the video, but I decided I had delayed enough premieres and that the video was okay without it. But now you know. So he's got to prepare to fight the Ebony Warrior. Problem is, three videos in, Ogrub's pretty much maxed out already with his stats and equipment. The only way I could think of to make him stronger was to change his lucky stones and to produce potions to boost his stats. Luckily this goes a long way. When you've got a high alchemy rating, it's easy to produce stuff to make him deal more damage or to take considerably less. I also produced some… experimental ones. I knew already that the Ebony Warrior liked to heal a lot so I made some that prevented his magic from replenishing. If the worst comes to the worst and I'm unable to end the battle in any other way, I can just poison him with this, then hit him over and over and over again until he runs out of magic and health. But I hope that while fighting the Ebony Warrior, I'd think of a better way to end it. Believe it or not, at this point I still didn't know what the fight was going to be like. I'd only practiced against him on that mountainside earlier, and he was hard as bulls, so I was actually a bit concerned that he'd be too difficult for Ogrub to stand a chance against at legendary difficulty. Just for the fun of it, let's see how Ogrub does at standard Skyrim difficulty. So yeah, Ogrub still sustains a lot of damage, but that's mostly his own attacks deflecting off the Ebony Warrior. Throw a few healing potions and shouts into the mix and you're not talking about a very hard fight at all. But Legendary Difficulty proved to be a decent challenge, and a great battle to end the Ogrub trilogy on. Funny thing is, it may look like Ogrub has just run along the mountain range a bit between these two clips, but they're actually entirely different places. If you stop to look at the trees in both then you can see this. But again, Skyrim was kind and let me play the joke that Ogrub's quest to find the Ebony Warrior was a lot shorter than it perhaps prepared the viewers for. Why artificially extend this video's length any further? I can already plaster this video with as many ads as I like. Not that I did. So, the Ebony Warrior battle. In game he's a lot friendlier. He comes to the player and says the game's gotten too easy and he would like you to send him to Sovereign Guard by defeating him in battle. But I kept his appearance more silent and menacing for this video, skipping the dialogue with a well-placed arrow before the camera was even rolling. It may sound strange having spoken about all the ways I've abused and broken this game to make the rest of this video, but I thought it was important that the Ebony Warrior battle was done for real, plus it helps with continuity. So I did it all in one take, no mods or anything like that. I only had one thing I wanted to do, and that was to take the action to the tallest mountain in Skyrim. In the first Ogre video he runs across the world, in the second he walks. The only way I could think of one-upping that in this video was to have him fight the hardest enemy across Skyrim. And that he does. By happy chance, this nicely split the fight into different segments. It starts with a sword fight, which is where Ogrub has the best chance of beating him. Blasting the Ebony Warrior off the cliff completes two things. It nicely moves the fight down into the main part of Skyrim, and it shows that blasting him off cliffs doesn't kill him. Otherwise I can imagine the comment section would be filled with smart asses telling me to. The disarm and then blast here was not scripted. 
I didn't expect it, and at first I was all like, oh no, this has gone terribly wrong, before realising that it probably improves the fight and ups the stakes. I grew up in an era where games would throw really hard bits at you later on, so I'm conditioned into saving all of my best potions and arrows for an imaginary boss that I never end up facing. I've seen a lot of comments asking why I used iron arrows against the ebony warrior, to which I'll say, because I ran out of everything else. I started with ebony and worked down. If you look in the bottom right hand corner of the screen then you can see that. So yeah, the battle does go on a bit, people do join the fight and I was just there backpedalling and thinking about how kind Skyrim was for giving me all of this excellent footage. Although all done in one take, I did save regularly. Not with the intention of loading, but you never know what will happen when you get to the editing stage. As it was, I did reload the tower bit to get this awesome shot from the sky. I asked Skyrim to provide some lightning and it was kind enough to deliver. Thanks Skyrim. I was very lucky not to be blasted off the top of the tower here myself. And look at that. You know how I used all of my best arrows against the Ebony Warrior earlier on? Now's the one instance where I needed them, and I've already run out. Serves me right for using the stuff that I should have saved forever instead, doesn't it? This guard deserves a medal. He came out of nowhere and stood his ground against the Ebony Warrior for a long time. Long enough for me to grow so fond of him that I did everything in my power to blast the Ebony Warrior over the river and onto the next part of the fight, letting the guard live to tell the tale. And here's the return of the messenger, at the most inconvenient time imaginable. I try to avoid calling the Ebony Warrior the Ebony Warrior as much as I can, since it leaves who the Ebony Warrior is in this video more down to the viewer's interpretation. The Ebony Warrior is by name, but Lydia literally is, and Ogre by the end is a dark knight, so all are worthy candidates. It was about halfway up this mountain that I suddenly realised that I could end it with the Greybeards. It took this long to think that up. I was so proud of myself I ate a tasty pizza immediately after recording was over. It really is a great conclusion to the fight, in my opinion better than killing him. It lets the Ebony Warrior remain undefeated and more powerful than Ogrub, even though Ogrub has clearly outsmarted him and has ended it all with a fight against the Greybeards, who have been well established in this video already. And it lets me shamelessly quote something from Batman, which was unbelievably relevant in this instance. This is what happens when an unstoppable force meets three immovable objects. This fight is destined to go on forever. He said his final farewell to this place, to the Greybeards, and to his brother. Ah, the classic reveal that the bad guy was the protagonist's family member. This was shoehorned in last minute as a jokey cliche that doesn't change anything whatsoever, but it fitted in with everything so far so I saw it as a freebie and was like, why not? It at least gives a possible reason for why the Ebony Warrior is hunting down Odd Grub, as who knows what sibling rivalry they've had in the past. This is unlike, say, Game of Thrones, which shows the Clegane brothers' rivalry but never bothers to explain why they both want to kill each other so much. Like, hear me out here, it starts off okay, the mountain burns the hound's face as a child, then they fight that jousting tournament, but then the king tells them to stop, they do, and they both go their separate ways. And then… nothing. If anything, their relationship improves with time. They then go through lots of character development, near-death experiences and stuff, and then we're expected to believe that, after all this, their only goal is to hunt each other down in the name of Clegane Bowl? No, it doesn't make sense, at least not in the way it's portrayed. At a push, I could imagine the Hound might want to do it if his time with Arya had meant nothing to him and if being a good guy who helps to save the world isn't enough for him, but as for the Mountain, are we seriously to believe that he has a grudge against his brother? even after he's become a zombie, and that if this hatred is so strong, how can he hold it together during this scene, but then later on go rogue in this bit, killing his maker just to initiate the Clegane Bowl? Their stories could have been so much more, and Clegane Bowl could still have been a thing, and yet their existences for the last few seasons were reduced to existing simply for fan service. I mean, I wanted Clegane Bowl as much as the next guy, but the way it happened was just… is that it, you know? And while we're on this topic, couldn't they have picked a better spot than on a staircase in a collapsing castle? And couldn't they have fought a bit more instead of having it ridiculously one-sided? The mountain literally has the high ground. And please don't try to explain this to me, I'm ranting and no half-explained rubbish about how it was justified will change this. Sorry, sidetracked a bit there. Back to the Ogre video, which has just gotten to a tough bit. With the main fight of the video over, the lure of the video's title has served its main purpose. What does the viewer have to look forward to now? How will I conclude the story? I did originally have a much worse ending. I talked about how Ogrub retired to solitude, spending every day pretending to be an old man, but at night he runs around behaving like Batman. 
The only good thing I could see about this ending was that I got to use lots of footage of him with a different, and hideous, helmet on to disguise who he was, as though that would be enough to hide him. But this ending was very weak, so I condensed the waking up sequence down as much as I could so I could get on with the scene that I'd been preparing for since doing the intro of the second video. I had been keeping a mental map in my head of where in Skyrim Odrib had already been, and intentionally kept him clear of this town just for this following sequence, which deliberately plays out identically to the bit at the start of the second video, but with a twist on the ending, once the dragon is slain. Now's a nice time to play them both side by side. So many people mentioned the hammer sink in the second video, I thought they might not in this one, what with it being 30 something minutes through it, but it was still the thing that so many viewers bothered to comment on, like that's the thing they'll remember most about this whole video. Please don't. Also, I think the guard here is female, but still talks with a male voice. Dragon! I'm not judging. While the intro of a video is the part I see the most, the ending is my least viewed bit. I rushed to get it done, thinking nothing much of it at the time, but I'm amazed by how well it turned out. The Batman music goes perfectly with it, and the script worked well, even though, up till actually recording it, I'd only had the final sentence planned out. Can Ogrub ever hope to atone for his past? He's going to find out. Another change I made to this video after its release was this scene, of Ogrub killing a baddie in a snowy region. Let's show some side by sides. Bits from his dreams earlier on in the episode end up happening, but with a twist. Ogrub isn't the one being killed by the Ebony Warrior, he's the one in the Ebony Warrior's shoes, killing bad guys. Those dreams of his weren't just worries about what would happen when he met his brother, they also double as fuzzy prophecies about what would happen beyond that. If only Bran's visions from Game of Thrones had been this insightful, I'm sad I didn't have time to make this twist more obvious in the version of the video that you saw. I wonder if anybody picked up on it still. Anyway, on with the end of the video. My throwaway footage from the Underground Forge syncs perfectly with what's being said, even down to the ghostly companion from that mission, whose name I think is Katrina, but at a glance I think she passes for Lydia. Skyrim continued to reward me by making things easier than I had expected. I wanted to show an audience, preferably seeing Ogreb saving the town from the dragon. I forgot that nearby NPCs rush to a dragon after it's been slain, so this made it easy for me. And then the guards all lined up in a neat little row as they stood up against Odgrub, unaware that he's now a good guy. It was brilliant. I was capturing this footage being all like, oh yes, more, as they acted it out exactly as I'd wanted them to. And there's the faint flash of lens flare. While this whole ending may appear to be a ripoff of the Dark Knights, it's actually the exact opposite. To succeed in his mission, Batman was a hero who had to become the villain in the eyes of the public, while Ogrub's a villain trying to become a hero. Both are tragic in their own ways. Despite lots of talking, this ending leaves pretty much everything unanswered. Will Ogrub live long enough to get the salvation he seeks? Is Lydia in Sovngarde? Does she know what Ogrub has become? Will the Greybeards eventually beat the Ebony Warrior? Or will he ultimately beat them? I leave all of this unanswered. After all, how can I possibly conclude these things in a way better than in the minds of my viewers? I'm sure that, by now, you have an idea of how you'd like for it to end, and fears about how it might not go according to plan. Imagination is a powerful thing, and I'd rather have an ending that entertains the possibility of a sequel, even if I have no intention of ever making one. Let's consider the alternative. Take Game of Thrones. It spent so many series building up all these elaborate, exciting and mysterious storylines. If you're anything like me, you spent a lot of time fantasising about possible encounters and battles that would happen about Bran's incredible powers and how he'd perform thousand IQ plays to tip the balance in the Stark's favour. How would the White Walkers get past this ice wall, and what terrible things would happen to mankind when they did? What significance would this ice castle have later on in the story? What shock deaths would occur, and how much would they change the path the story takes? Then the ending draws near and that kind of stuff is replaced with, how the hell are they going to cram all of this in just a few remaining episodes? Then you reach the end and the only solace you have are all the dank memes the guys over on the Free Folk subreddit are cooking up. Some things are best left to the imagination, unless you have some seriously talented writers to put off the impossible by thinking up an ending better than the entire show's viewer base combined. Okay, I got sidetracked there a bit as well. This third Ogre video was a labour of love, 
when people start out with YouTube or video game development or, or mapping, I think they have an idea in their head of a dream project they'd like to complete. Back at the start, you have a lot of enthusiasm and motivation, but lack the knowledge and patience to pull it off. Over time your enthusiasm goes down and your knowledge goes up, so really when they intersect is the best time to work on that dream project of yours. I think I'm over here now. When you stick at something for long enough, you end up compromising. You strike a balance between what you want to make and what your audience wants to see. A video like this Ogrub one is something I urge every long-time YouTuber to try. To set aside all YouTube politics and just to set out on a massive project they've always wanted to do. When I envisioned this video, I pictured some scenes as being highlights, like Lydia's death or the Ebony Warrior battle, but I think the result is… but it's flatter than that. Yes, those bits have impact, but people have been equally entertained by quieter moments or by fluke events along the way. Sometimes those bits can be even better because they're not bogged down with having to tell a set story. The weakest part of the Ogreb trilogy, in my opinion, is the first half of the second video because it's too busy trying to tell a story. I think I've handled this third video a lot better from what I learned from the second one. I know already that this making of video won't be popular. This making of series has had fewer views than any other video of mine in recent memory. I still think it's important I made it, but I can see why you dislike it, or worse still, dislike me for making it. If this making of series has sounded like I'm showing off about how smart I am for cramming in so many references into a single video, yeah, that's cause I am. I spent over 5 months on a single video, how could I not obsess about it and shoehorn in as much stuff as I could? Believe it or not, there used to be even more references. In earlier versions, I referred to the Ebony Warrior as a mountain of a man who kept hounding Old Grub's dreams, but then I decided that Game Bowl references, although actually very suitable, just didn't need to be added. Plus, why would I want my video associated with such a travesty? I'm okay with a video being full of tributes to other things, provided they don't stand out as only being references to those other things. If people who don't get the references can hear them and still think they're suitable for the video, then no harm done. And if I get people into quotes and music from other media that I'm also fond of, then that's gotta be a positive thing. So yeah, I'm sorry if this making of is becoming I am very smart material, but I figure that if you're here watching a making of then you want to understand the thought that went into making it. Spending months and months on a single video is quite lonely, I have all these ideas, many of which I know will never be picked up on by the viewers, even if it's viewed hundreds of thousands of times. Although the video is about a man called Ogrub who likes bashing things, I don't just want it to appeal to the lowest common denominator, I want to have subtle jokes and stuff that might only be picked up on repeat viewings. I love how Lydia wants to change Ogrub, and actually achieves it but has to die for it to happen. It's tragic. I like how Ogrub drops her gauntlets in Sovngarde as some kind of symbolic gesture even if it doesn't really achieve all that much. I like how after every meaningful encounter with the Ebony Warrior, Ogrub wakes up, implying that the Ebony Warrior is all in his imagination, symbolic of his fears of no longer being the best or, or maybe his past catching up with him. Maybe he's just going mad, I, I don't know. Maybe he's got Alzheimer's and that's why he's always displacing his clothing and gauntlets and sword. Maybe he didn't find Lydia's gauntlets on that mountain. Maybe all of that was just part of a hypothermic dream and he wakes up as the sun rises because it warms him up enough to survive the night. Maybe after defeating the Ebony Warrior, Ogrub wakes up back where the fight first started because the battle never happened and instead he actually just had a very nice sleep that lasted all night, during which he sorted his life out, ended the nightmares and took the place of the Ebony Warrior. It's just a matter of knowing what to say out loud during the video and how much to be left to the viewer to work out for themselves and for them to be free to interpret it however they like. I think I can get away with all this deep stuff, as long as the video also works on a literal level. There's this whole death of the author thing where the writer shouldn't try to explain their creation and that it should just stand as its own thing, which this making of series clearly goes against. If nothing else, I hope this series has given you a good reason to re-watch the Ogre video from another perspective, or maybe even a good reason to make one of those English essays at school about Ogre instead of a traditional movie of some kind. That would be dank. I've talked extensively about how some of the best bits of this video came about through mistakes or by going with what happened naturally, but this whole video was down to something equally unlikely. The first Ogrub video was well received, but there was a substantial number of people who would shoot down the video by saying that their character was stronger or by dismissing Ogrub's character build by saying that he doesn't play on legendary difficulty or that he hasn't fought against the Ebony Warrior. At first I took offence to these kinds of comments, it felt like they were piggybacking on my hard work to make themselves sound better and it took a lot of willpower not to argue with them. As a YouTuber, you have to find a way of dealing with these kinds of comments, and I did it by changing my attitude. I thought to myself, 
Maybe these comments weren't intended as insults. Maybe they were from people so enthralled by Ogrub's story that they were saying these things because they wanted to see more of him and against harder challenges. Hence why in the following videos, Ogrub faces Legendary Difficulty and the Ebony Warrior. I used these comments to create new and better content. So in a way, I have these comments to thank for that. And I also want to say thank you to all of you who posted positive comments. I didn't expect so many genuinely nice things to be said. No buts, no ulterior motives, just comments from people who had enjoyed the video and who wanted to let me know. YouTubing doesn't get much better than this. I have spent many happy months looking through all of them and will continue to do so for many years to come. Of course, since this latest video I've seen comments challenging Ogrub to beat Karstag or that Lydia's in the soul can, but I'm old school. I played Skyrim before these expansions were a thing. So in my version of the game, these weren't things I concerned myself with. But rather than to reply to these people telling them that, why don't I get their ideas and see if I can't make some stories from them?